Brothers and sisters, great to hear the buzz out there. I'm just looking down here. My wife is in the spotlight this morning. Isn't that lovely? And with a glittery necklace as I look at her smiling face. And Let's just pray before I start and before I share. Father, just thank you for the time of worship. And as John has said this morning, the hope that we have in Jesus. And Father, now I just ask that you'd enable me to share what is on my heart. That I believe is on your heart for us, Lord, as your people as your children. And I, enjoy, I just invite you, Holy Spirit, to come now in what I share and also for those who are to receive, Lord, that you may help us understand your word to us. And even afterwards, when we take communion together, Lord, that we may just know and realize what you have done for us. We need to thank you for your love, your amazing love, and your amazing grace to each one of us here this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't know how many of you were here last week. Can you put your hands up? Wasn't Andrew amazing? Yeah. Superb. And uh, if you haven't heard, then just listen to the podcast from last week where it was about locker room talk. It was a locker room chat that Andrew took, took us through and uh, about pressing on. It was just brilliant. Uh, we all st stood and clapped and shouted and so on at the end. And so we were so encouraged about what God gave him for us. And, uh, of course, he was talking about being a, the coach in the team, speaking half-time. And as leaders, we have that responsibility. But God is our greatest coach of all, that he, uh, you know, and Jesus to encourage us to press on to all that we've got. And Andrew also said about the, you know, sometimes in the, you, then the, the, it's one thing you have the, the, the speak before the game, but actually in the half-time. And then you're there, and perhaps you haven't done as well as you ought, and you're 3-0 down if you're playing soccer or whatever it is. And... I say, look, it's only half time. Look, let's just press on. That's the coach's job. And that's what Andrew was doing last week. Come on, it may be half time, but let's press on to take what God has got for us as a church and as individuals uh, for our lives. And, uh, and so in that context, uh, he spoke on uh, a bit from Philippians and so on and elsewhere. But he, he mentioned this in passing. And I'd already had this ready for this week in, just as a verse about spurring one another on. Spurring one another on. And actually, that so resonated with me what Andrew shared this week. So I'm launching from what Andrew said, and I'm just focusing in on a couple of things this morning, and I'll be speaking further next week as well. Of course, he was referring a lot to sport last week and the halftime. And I'm just going to read uh, something which some of you may have heard me read before, but I think it is very pertinent to what uh, uh, Andrew has shared this last week. And it's about a man called... Uh, 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 Regals. His name was Regals. Um, in 1929, Georgia Tech was playing California in a postseason game. Late in the second half, in one of the games in a classic Rose Bowl football contest on New Year's Day 1929, the scores were tied. Now, in a crucial moment of the game, Roy Regals scooped up a loose ball. He cut in and out of the traffic, eluded tacklers and breath with breathtaking athleticism. He sprinted the distance of the field and he ran 70 yards. But he was tackled one yard shy of the goal line by his own teammate. California had attempted to punt the deep into their own zone, but the kick was blocked and Georgia Tech scored a safety. In other words, he kicked it into, uh, into touch, I presume, in American football. Ron Regals lost his bearings and ran the wrong way. Now, this was a great player, apparently. For the rest of his life, he was not known for his remarkable athletic abilities. He never escaped the reputation as Roy Wrong Way Regals. What about that? But in commenting on this event, Dr. Bruce Wilkinson wrote this, Run with speed, run with power, but ultimately all that matters is the right destination. Get it? It's where you're going, not where you come from, that matters, yeah? And in the lockers at halftime, Regals sat in the corner with his face buried in his hands, crying. And the coach didn't make his usual halftime speech, but before the team went onto the field in the second half, he said, the starting team, that's including Regals, was, goes back on this half. The whole team left except Regal, and he had his face in his hands. He said, I can't do it, coach. I've ruined the game. I've ruined the team. The coach said... 
Get up, Regals. The game is only half over. You belong on the field. And for some of you today, the question is, it may be half time, as Andrew said last time, but the game is only half over. Get up because the rest of the half of your life or the rest of your life is ahead of you. And that is for us as a church, although I believe this church will go on way beyond the, dis the distance that we've already been in time. But actually, where are you? Are you in half time at this point feeling pleased with yourself, as Andrew said last week, or feeling dreadful that somehow you have failed along the way and made uh, uh, some awful mistakes. Apostle, uh, the Apostle Paul said in Philippians, he said, you know, not that I've already attained all this, but he says he presses on to the goal and for what, uh, what Christ has called him, and he presses on, on onwards, forgetting what is behind and straining to what is ahead. And the key verse, and Tim shared it today in, uh, in, in our prayer meeting before, and is about fixing our eyes on the Lord, and we know that God is with us. And our aim is to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. So it's all about spurring one another on. And the verse that is my key verse today is from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. Many of you can quote it, you know it. But it says this, And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as the day is approaching. See, it's a, the two words here I want to bring out of this today are this, one another. It says about spur one another on and encourage one another even as the day approaches. The importance of encouragement in team is so, so important, isn't it? I mean, you, you miss it as a, you know, as a team member and you really can feel down and you, the rest of your game has had it. But actually, you've got the encouragement of your team members to encourage one another on. And that's what we do when we come together, be it in smaller groups, in informal groups, in the group we meet on a Sunday or elsewhere in different types of groups with youth and so on. We are encouraging one another and spurring one another on. And it is so, so important that one does that. And where you can't or you can't for work reasons, get listening to the podcast to catch up with what has been said and also get into a small group. Great that we went to a small group this week with Rob and Susie, Ryan and Jones. What a lovely atmosphere, what a great time to be together. We could, you could feel the spurring of one another on uh, towards love and good deeds and the encouragement that is to everybody concerned. So the sporting analogy has been like football the is, and many other games, hockey and various things, are a game of two halves. You've heard the saying that soccer is a game of two halves. Yeah? So actually, for some... It's uh, that sort of game, it's a team game for others, it's individuals, and actually just pressing on, life is a race, and life is a race that you've got to run. But I want to just bring out something now um, as to something that's happened in, in past weeks, a number of weeks ago. You probably know that, the, uh, that Alistair and Johnny uh, Brownlee were uh, uh, the gold, uh, gold Olympic champion, and his brother Johnny was the uh, silver medalist in Rio uh, this year. And there was another race that came. Jen and I were in Spain when this happened, and Darren Clifford showed it to us. But I was just so touched when I saw it as to what the Brownlee brothers, at the end of the race, there was Johnny, uh, the previous silver medalist in Rio, actually ahead of his brother and the other guy, and he was running one kilometer away when he was starting to be overcome by the de the, the desperately by the heat of the day. So if we can just see this video. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Laura. Now. Johnny has to win and to be sure of taking the title. And right now he seems to have lost control of his legs. And this is worrying. Oh, and he's starting to slow. And there is a little way to go. There's half a K to go. And Johnny is running out of time and is losing... He's losing his sense of direction. This is worrying. Oh, goodness me. This is a horrible sight. Jonathan Brownlee has lost it now and has staggered to a stop at the side of the course. And Alistair's stopped to help him along. And Alistair is going to try and carry his brother home. Dramatic scenes in Cozumel as the Olympic champion carries his younger brother towards the podium. 
Oh my God, I cannot believe what we are seeing here. Matt, is this allowed? Is he allowed to help his brother? You know, is that part of the rules? I'm not too sure. We've never seen anything like this before. Unbelievable scenes. Unbelievable scenes in Cosima. The Brownie brothers arm in arm. But it's not by way of celebration. Henry Schumann's celebrating. He's going to win this race in Cozumel out of nowhere. But we have to be concerned about the health of Jonathan Brownlee. And they're not even on the final stretch yet. Schumann wins in Cozumel. The brothers are coming home arm in arm to finish in second and third. But Johnny can hardly stand. And Alistair is having to drag him across the line and pushing him home, pushing him home for second. Johnny finishes in second. Goodness me, what an incredible conclusion here in Cozumel. I've never seen anything like that anywhere in world sport. How many of you saw that before? Yeah, isn't it amazing? And the amazing thing is the way that he pushed his brother over ahead of him. And uh, it's that sort of running the race and spurring one another on. If there's anything graphically that's come through in that, even Theresa May mentioned it at the end of her speech to the Conservative conference, uh, I heard her say. But I think it's just worth remembering of, you know, yeah, we're in this to win the race in a sense, and we are there to run the race as if to win, it says. Uh, with the, uh, in, in scripture, but actually we are there for one another along the way and this is uh, just amazing uh, you know uh, well, way that his, he treated his brother but after, afterwards in an interview he said I would have done the same for anyone else because he was so in danger that, of falling and he could have had a serious injury and so but for, you know just like the picture of the brother in Christ or the sister in Christ and then carrying them on and over the line and that may be where we are with people both uh, within the, the church, you know, in a sense, our brothers and sisters, if I might use it prophetically, and also for those, like, uh, John, uh, like Alistair said, you would have done it for anybody else as well. And we are there to encourage and to spur people on, uh, and, uh, and certainly to encourage each other in the church to do so. So let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, it says in Hebrews uh, chapter 10. And is fixing our eyes on Jesus. The one another scriptures, two of them, two two parts that I want to bring out of this next scripture, which is another main scripture for me this morning. Uh, and I'll move on, move on, Laura, to the to the next one uh, as time is going on to Romans 15. And uh, it's, this is I call the one another passage. There's another one another passage in Romans 12 as well. It's interesting how many one another's there are in uh, in scripture in the New Testament. But uh, in Romans 15, verse 1 to 7, it says this, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good, to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, as it is written, The insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we may have hope. Interesting, isn't it? We've had that this morning. We have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and with one voice you may glorify God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. We see the one another as the bear with one another in verse 1. There's the edify or build one another up in verse 2. Uh, as I said in Romans 12, it says in the other one another passage, uh, it says, be devoted to one another in love and honor one another uh, above yourselves. Live in harmony with one another, it says. In elsewhere in Scripture, it says this, forgive one another, love one another several times. In fact, the most times of any one another is, is love one another. That I found. Accept one another as we've just read. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Uh, serve one another and bear with one another and encourage one another. There's a lot of one another's there and I'm not going to do them all this morning, I promise. All right? But actually, I, I just want to uh, just say that I just need, we need to know about accepting one another and the acceptance that comes firstly from God to us 
and it says, accept one another as God has accepted you. And so this whole thing about acceptance is so, so important. Knowing God's acceptance of you, he, you know, he saw you where you were. He loved you just the same. But he didn't want you where you were. He sent his son to come for you, to bring you in, into relationship with himself. God wants you to come into that place of understanding his acceptance. It says in uh, Psalm 103, it says, he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. And I think this morning there may be people really grappling with the things they've done wrong in their life. Maybe now, at the, you know, right up to date. Maybe a year ago. Maybe 20, 30 years ago. People still have difficulty in coping with their memories of sin. And you've got to understand this. It says this in Scripture. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. And as far as from the east is from the west, so he has removed our transgressions or sins from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. You see, God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And he loves us just the same now, and he loves you whatever you have done since, and whatever you will do in the future. And so his acceptance is there, and his love is there for us. The problem that happens is that sometimes we find difficulty in accepting others. But the scripture says, accept others as the Lord has accepted you. And it can be a very difficult thing because actually we so want acceptance. Acceptance means, in a Bible dictionary, being received approval or pleasure. In the Bible, things or a person are often said to be acceptable to men and to God. And human acceptance or rejection of other humans is affected by many things such as race, class, clan, sex, actions of an individual, prejudice, etc. On a human level, Jesus shows us that all human beings are to be accepted, to be loved for their own sake, simply because they are persons created in the image of the Heavenly Father. There is value. We emphasize it again and again. You know what? I just love this church because I just love you. But I just love something of this church, the way that people are accepting such an accepting group of people. Would you agree with me on that? You know, the way that people accept others. Now, we're not perfect, I know that. We, you know, and we go through different times and we find difficulty. But, I, I, you know, it's so, so important within a church that one's accepting. If you look at the context of Romans 15, you have to start back at Romans 14, verse 1, where again he says, accept one another and do not uh, allow, you know, uh, disputable things, he calls it, come in, where if you read it, it's all about food sacrifice to idols. Well, the weak people are the ones who wouldn't, who wanted to stick to the legalistic or the, the ways. They didn't have the freedom to understand what Christ had done for them. And those are the weak people, according to Paul. And, uh, and, and the strong ones were the ones who were free of that. And there was a feast day and what they eat didn't matter to them. Because Christ was, you know, uh, all to them. But it says the strong ones in that way, in that, their conscience, ought to be actually uh, concerned about the weak. And, you know, whether you eat or drink or anything else, you do it so you build your brother up. So there's a very important outworking of how we work to one another, uh, you know. And the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul was saying in the Romans 14 passage. Not getting caught up in disputable matters. And I was saying to somebody recently, that is the problem with churches over the years. They've got involved with disputable matters. Where the organ is, what the color of the carpet is, what this, uh, this should happen or that should happen. Those things are disputable matters. They do not matter. And they become big things. And they shouldn't be. What, what do you eat? Well, you know, are you vegetarian? Are you meaty? Are you, you know, what, what, what do you do? And it's important that there's an acceptance of one another. We all love to be accepted. Most people don't want to stand out in a crowd. There are some people who love to be up the front and out in the crowd. I mean, I mean uh, there are others, and most of us, I would say, do not like to appear the odd person out in the crowd. And uh, I just ask you, do you remember the yellow 
Page's advert of some years ago about, um, let, let's just see it. Let's have a look at it. 118-24-7. I need a taxi, please. Look, my invite definitely said elves, OK? Has the penny dropped? And for the people on the podcast, I'll just explain it then, and for those who didn't get it. So the man wanted to call quickly. There he was, dre dressed in an elf suit outfit, and he wanted to get away as soon as possible because he obviously felt completely out of place because the, the invite was to an Elvis lookalike party. But of course, he turned up as an elf, not an Elvis. So uh, I, that's, that's where the, the, the rub is. So actually, um, he, he certainly felt uncomfortable, and they certainly were saying, you don't belong here. Did you notice that? They were standing all together and actually portraying, well, you dress as an elf, mate. You don't belong. We're all Elvises here. And, uh, and it's so, so important as church that one doesn't become so, in a sense, Christianized that when speaking the Christian speak and all the rest of it, the people come in and think, oh, I can never, what are you talking about? What language is that? You know, that we actually are able to relate to people. And it says in 1 Corinthians, it says about becoming all things to all men that we may win them and win them over to Christ. And so, so it's important in the way that we behave, the way we act towards one another, that we accept one another. And Jesus uh, was one who accepted people uh, and the church's mission is to walk as Jesus walked or to live as Jesus lived, it says. Um, he was accepting of lepers, tax collectors, prostitutes, all sorts of different people. The people who other people rejected, he accepted, and we are to do the same. It, <clears throat> with the woman caught in adultery, for instance, there she was. She was certainly not accepted by those who brought her to him. And, uh, and what he did was there, he showed the difference between approval and acceptance. Do you know there's a difference? Approval and acceptance. Now you may uh, not approve of something, but you can accept somebody. You may not approve of their behavior, but you can accept them. God doesn't necessarily approve of all that we do, but he accepts us in the beloved. When you see the picture and the story of Jesus with the woman caught in adultery brought to him, uh, he said, you know, he didn't approve because he said, go sin no more. He made it clear that was sin and she shouldn't sin anymore. But he said, uh, uh, did they condemn you because they didn't pick up the stone? Because he said, those who without sin cast the first stone. And he said, no. She said, no. He said, neither do I condemn you. But he didn't condone her either. He didn't condone, but he didn't condemn. But he accepted her. And give her a new start. And the fantastic, wonderful thing about the gospel and the, the gospel and the relationship we have with God the Father is that is mercies are new every morning for all of us. The mercies this morning are the same as what they were when you first gave your life to Jesus maybe years ago. And his mercies are new every morning. And so we have acceptance uh, through Christ and what he has done for us. He doesn't condemn us. He wants us to come into a relationship with him. If you do not know him this morning, that's what he's calling you to do. I'm going to move on, Laura, missing a little bit here, to go on to forgiveness. Forgiveness is forgive one another. It's not in this passage, but it's in the Colossians passage, which if we could uh, uh, read, read out, it's uh, Colossians chapter 3. Have you got that? If not, don't worry. It says, it says about forgiving one another as God or Christ has forgiven you. I've lost it in my notes, actually, so that's why I'm sort of scratching around here. So, uh, so actually, that God wants us to forgive. Now, all a part of acceptance can be forgiveness, but there's all this one another part where there's accept one another, there's forgive one another. Now, it's one of the most important things that we understand that we forgive because God has forgiven us. He says, as God has forgiven you, forgive others. And it is, as we come together for communion this morning, we are going to be recognizing and proclaiming what Jesus did for us at the cross in Calvary, at Calvary and, and how we were forgiven through his sacrifice on our behalf. And interestingly, you know, for forgiveness as forgiveness is, it's not easy sometimes for people because actually somebody once said, 
forgiveness is a great idea until you've got something to forgive. And, you know, one's not minimizing what can or could have been done and so on. But it actually is for our own sakes that we need to forgive as well as God commands us to forgive. Because if we don't forgive, it can affect us more than the person we need to forgive. There's a saying, hold a grudge for long enough and the grudge will get hold of you. And that's a grudge, but actually I'm not saying it's the same as forgiveness, but actually one can really get quite bound up in these sorts of things. There's the working or outworking of forgiveness that has to happen uh, in relationship with a person. So c without that, it is sometimes very difficult to work out forgiveness. Without, so it's, it's much more complicated than simply just forgive. But if one can actually come to the point of asking God to help you to forgive, then God will enable you and lead you along to that, however long that takes to come to a place of forgiveness. And, you, you know, forgiveness is such an important thing for ourselves as well as what God requests of us. I think if, um, if, you know, sometimes people can be harder on themselves about accepting themselves for something they've done than what they would be on other people. Do you find that sometimes? You could, like, forgive somebody else or something. But if you did that same thing, you'd be harder on yourself. I certainly, I've, I've experienced that and I've spoken to other people who feel that. And, uh, and you've got to understand that, you know, that God accepts you. God's forgiven you. And actually, we have to come to a place of understanding and accepting ourselves and in a way, forgiving ourselves. You know, th to understand that we've got to let things go. And when we come to communion this morning, there may be things that crop up that just before we go... I don't want anybody to miss out on communion this morning who wants to take communion. Not through any guilt or condemnation or feelings of, you know, they've missed it. Therefore, they can't take communion. It is very simple in, in, in this, that in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. And for those who are struggling to actually get to that place, um, then just ask God to help you. And even just the fact that you're asking God to help you and you want to do that rather than, oh, you're not doing that, means that you are in a place to come and take communion. And that may take a long time to work through. And I think we can be really, really hard on each other and on, on, each, on ourselves, sorry, rather than on each other. And, uh, you know, things happen in life which can really paralyze you and the thing about guilt is it's, it's paralysis or feeling unworthiness is paralysis or feeling you did this therefore you can't now serve the Lord rubbish Paul was uh, uh, what he called himself the you know the chief of sinners the worst of sinners having killed Christians having plotted against and yet he saw the grace of God and the forgiveness of God and he wrote these things for us to read today and the, and the problem is, if you dwell on a thing or something that's happened to you recently or in the past and keep on dwelling back on that, then you could be, you know, just living in a place of spiritual paralysis. God wants you free today. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, there's freedom, there's forgiveness, there's acceptance, there's understanding uh, that God is for us. I was just thinking about the sport uh, link and people, in a sense, having a fresh start or feeling they missed it. Now, I don't know if this guy's a, a Christian, but you, you've heard of Gareth Southgate, haven't you? Yeah. Now, how many of you remember back 20 years ago to the Euros when he missed the penalty? The penalty in the semi-final, the penalty kickoff against Germany in England, I think it was, before the home crowd. And he was devastated, absolutely devastated. And uh, uh, Seaman was trying to comfort him and so on. And, uh, imagine what that man felt like. I mean, he, he geared his whole life. He felt he'd, he'd let people down. He felt 
but you know the acceptance of his, his teammates was there for him. But still, he would have been grappling with that. It was, I mean, people used to call a missed penalty shot then from there on as in a in a shootout as being he did a Southgate. You know, it was like linked to him. He went on though, and he gained from that after a number of months. I think he came out of it, but he gained 57 caps for England. And do you know what he is now? He's manager now. He's managing England now. Imagine what he can say to the guys who feel he missed it. See, when you've been through it and you come out the other side, you've got something to say about it. And we've all got something to say about it, even if we haven't got through it, we can point to Scripture and so on. But this was a man who went through it, and now he's caretaker manager for England, and also he'd done the, the, the younger England team and so on. But, you know, what, what I'm saying this morning is, look, let's just spur one another on to love and good deeds. And if you see somebody struggling, just draw alongside them so you can make it. It's only half time. It's only half time. You can do it from here. And so it's knowing God's acceptance and forgiveness as we've read and also knowing that Jesus died for us while we're still sinners. And actually, we can, in Hebrews 4, it says, you know, about approaching the throne of grace. It says, you see, it's not that, like, we don't have somebody, a high priest, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But Jesus was tempted in every way as we are or were, uh, or he was tempted, and was yet without sin. And it goes on to say, therefore, since we have a high priest like this, let us approach the throne of grace in our time of need, in our time of need. And there may be people feeling in need this morning, and you need to understand that we are here for you, and we want to be the one another to you. And God certainly wants to know you to know that he hasn't left you. Tim emphasized that this morning in the prayer meeting so clearly you know, God is with you, come what may, wherever, whatever you're feeling, God is there for you. And so we're going to have a time of communion now. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to break bread together by um, people coming out to the four uh, tables out on the, each corner of the room. And perhaps you'd like to go out to the outside and come back on the inside, whichever is easiest for you. But I will be showing a video um, uh, and... It's interesting, the words in this video, I saw this this week, this lady, uh, Laura, Lauren Daigle, sings a song called uh, How Can It Be, not Anne Can It Be, that was the old hymn, but How Can It Be, and I thought, well, this is just so appropriate for where one sometimes will feel, but actually to where God has brought us, and she was singing at a uh, Hillsong tour in the USA, and she's uh, going to be at Hillsong Sydney, I don't know if she's going to be at Hillsong London next year in, in 2017, but apparently she's won Grammy Awards in the, for Christian music. But the words of this in the, the, the first verse, if you want to listen to it as you're breaking bread, um, I am guilty, ashamed of what I've done, what I've become, these hands are dirty. I dare not lift them up to the Holy One. You plead my cause, you right my wrongs. You break my chains, you overcome. You gave your life you, to give me mine. You say that I am free. How can it be? How can it be? So let's just uh, be ready to break bread and then the team will come, uh, the worship team will come to lead us in a song after that. So I'm going to just read the scripture first and then we'll just please move out as soon as you see the video starting to, to happen. Because Paul wrote this to the Corinthians. He said, for what I received from the Lord, what I passed on, for I, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, if there are people listening on the podcast, I could even encourage you at home 
to just perhaps get some bread and wine or some juice and, and bread and do this as well as you come to God for yourself. I've encouraged you in the past to break bread in home groups. I would encourage you to break bread in your homes as families. And uh, it may be that you'd want to do this if you've listened to this podcast and listened to the words on this song as well as to what God has done for you. So let's just uh, see that, uh, Laura, that video. If you'd like to start coming forward.
can stand and respond in worship together. Cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his hands, his feet, my Savior, that cursed tree. 